Hello, my name is Rory Ridley Duff. Uh, I'm making this video a uh, simple guide to the Fair Shares model uh, in my capacity as reader in Cooperative and Social Enterprise at Sheffield Business School. Uh, but I'm also making it for Social Enterprise Europe, where I'm a director, the Fair Shares Association, where I'm a co-founder, and the International Cooperative Business Education Consortium, where I act as chair. So, what is the Fair Shares model? Fair Shares model is a whole suite of intellectual property that we've created to support multi-stakeholder cooperation within member-owned social enterprises. It's made up of a website where we've got introductory information about why it came about, what it's for, and how it works. We have a Fair Shares wiki, which has got more technical information, we have three sets of model rules, one for associations, one for cooperatives, and one for companies that implement the fair shares model. We've got a discussion forum where our members and our supporters can make proposals, debate and take decisions. There are some short articles, some conference papers and academic articles that have been published in a journal, and also a full length book called the case for fair shares. We've got some diagnostic tools, seven, uh, that you can use in consultancy and research. And there's also learning materials that were published in the case for fair shares, but have also been included in one of the popular textbooks on social enterprise. So the Fair Shares Association formed in 2013 to promote this, and we created a company in 2015. Uh, and we have some websites the way you can get further information. The fair shares model is based on a set of values and principles that we agreed in 2012. We believe in wealth and power sharing amongst primary stakeholders. We'll explain what those are in a moment. We also believe that the choice of goods and services offered should be subject to robust ethics. So you're not creating goods and services that harm people or the environment. We also think that the way those goods and services are produced and the way they're retailed, if you do that, should also be subject to ethical review. As social enterprise specialists, we believe in defining a social purpose for the enterprise and helping people audit the impact of their operations. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, we believe in a social democratic model for ownership, governance and management of capital. And we're not just talking about financial capital here. We're talking about human capital, social capital, intellectual capital and environmental capital. Now, because it's a multi-stakeholder model, some people believe that it is too complicated. But we're making this video so that you can judge for yourself because the whole purpose of fair shares is to make the running of an enterprise simpler. An easy way to show you that fair shares is not that complicated is to demonstrate that people are using it. The person you can see in the picture here is Rob Jameson. He's based in the USA and he's been working with an Australian called Eric Dorian and they recently registered any share society as a fair shares company uh, in the USA uh, and I'm now going to play you a short video that they've prepared about their plans. The path of human history radically changed 10,000 years ago during the Neolithic period. During this time people went from being hunters and gatherers to growing crops thus creating a surplus of food for the first time in human history. The freeing up of labor made way for technological advances, but also created the need for a leader's class to manage this extra activity. Over time, an inequality between the leading members and everyone else started to grow. So fast forward to today, and massive wealth and income inequality has become the norm. The corporations of today play a very large part in this inequality. To illustrate how things could be different, just imagine the hundreds of billions of dollars that Apple, 
Microsoft, and Google alone have at hand. Just these three companies alone could single-handedly end world hunger if their cash stockpiles were shared equitably. Modern day businesses are built by four stakeholder groups. Founders, investors, employees, and customers. We believe that all four of these shareholder groups are needed to have a voice in the direction of the company and to share in its profits. Not sharing voting and profit with all the stakeholder groups perpetuates inequality within the community. I'm very proud to say that Mass Mosaic has decided to become the first internet fair shares company. As Mass Mosaic grows and earns surplus profits, instead of them being returned to investors only or sitting in the bank, they're going to be returned to all stakeholder groups, including our members. The ability to have a voice in the direction of an up-and-coming company that is set in stone in the company's structure is unheard of with the status quo. By contributing to a company that's equitable at its core, people can trust that they are being part of the solution to a widespread inequality that we see today. Making Mass Mosaic a success will spur others to go down this path. And widespread adoption will right a wrong that's been over 10,000 years in the making. Welcome to part two of this Fair Shares Guide. In part one, we watched a video made by the person you can see in this picture called Rob Jameson. He and Eric Dorian registered AnyShare Society as a Fair Shares company in the USA on the 13th of January in 2016. We showed that video to suggest that Fair Shares isn't as complicated as some people make out. Nevertheless, we do want to tackle this issue of Fair Shares being complicated. We do think it can be harder to explain, but it's also easier to operate. And the reason for that is that fair shares is a product of practice. There are many years, as much as 30 years experience of designing constitutions that make running social enterprises simpler. Now, of course, the constitutions themselves will be more complicated, but the options it provides to you to run your social enterprise end up being simpler. Dumbing down complexity can make things easier to explain, but it also results in more confusion, more cost and real life complexity when you have to deal with the way that the world is rather than how you want it to be. So we want to show you how the world is. Firstly, members of the Fair Shares Association have studied the ownership, governance and management models in some of the world's most successful worker and solidarity co-ops. They show that being prepared for complexity makes facing it simpler. So let's start with a detailed examination of how the world is. So how do enterprises begin? All enterprises start with one or more people who have an idea that they maybe will make them money, uh, but certainly, if you're a social entrepreneur, it will improve society or the community or the environment in which you live. Social enterprises, based on work that is available from sustainable enterprise solutions, suggest that social enterprises are far more likely to be started by groups of people, often six to eight people. In contrast, private enterprises are usually started when a single person goes self-employed or maybe two people go into partnership. Those founders, at least in the first instance, provide the labour that the enterprise needs to get going. Now, founders usually have two relationships to their enterprise. They direct it and become its directors, and they work for it and become its labour force. And that might be all they're seeking to achieve. They might only be trying to create employment for themselves. But for many, they may choose or be forced by demand for services and goods to recruit more labour so that they can expand their operations. So founders start to recruit other people to help them produce goods and services. They're not just providing labour, they're also recruiting labour. 
And after the startup phase comes to an end, they'll continue to invest in improving skills in producing goods and services. They'll continue to recruit and develop labour. Now the recruitment of labour might take many forms. It might be that you're recruiting volunteers or contractors or other individuals and companies that act as suppliers. The labour might be the owner members, you know, the founders, or it might be people who are recruited to um, work under employment contracts. So there's a range of legal statuses, but whatever their status, they are all sources of labour for the enterprise and the fair shares model encourages you to treat them as labour members or labour shareholders. Now, as soon as you've got goods and services that meet people's needs, you're going to find that people want to use them, maybe buy them. So that's going to create more demand for labour. But we need to remember that sometimes people might labour for themselves. In other words, they produce goods and services and they consume them themselves. In a food co-op, you might grow food and then you'll use that food. If you put solar panels on your roof, uh, either individually or as a collective, you'll probably want to use the energy that you produce and just sell what you don't need to the market. Similarly, in sports clubs and theatre co-ops, you're going to be consciously uh, creating the um, sports environment and the theatre environment, but you might also buy tickets to go and see what you've produced. So there's a difference between production for use and production for market. In a production for use economy, the workers consume their own produce and they only sell surpluses in the marketplace. But under a system of production for market, people are prevented from consuming their own produce. When you go to work, if you were to take something from work, you might end up being reported to the police. And so under threat of prison, you don't use what you produce at work. So under a production for market system, labour is required to produce for others. And then when they've got their wages, they go back to the market and get goods for themselves. There may only be a few users, large users, or there may be many small scale users. But whichever, for an enterprise to become stable, it's got to have a sufficient number of users to ensure that there's enough work for the people who do the production. And that applies whether it's an enterprise that's doing production for use or production for the market. And lastly, we have investors. Now, an enterprise can expand more rapidly with the help of what we might call non-users who invest additional time, skills and money. Non-users may not be needed. However, more complex projects, particularly if you're going to engineer things, build things, uh, do buildings, construction, they're going to benefit if you can find non-users who can provide you with financial capital. But even if you do that, they're not the only investors. Founders, people who provide labour and the users of products and services are continually investing their time, effort and skills. They invest human, intellectual, social capital and they might provide you with finance capital as well. So we need to say, if this is how the world is, why do we design organisations to not recognise all of the interests necessary survival that we're showing in this diagram here? Why do we not automatically invite people in all of these groups to become legal members of the enterprise? The crux of fair shares is that we believe that if an enterprise does not recognise all the stakeholders necessary for survival, it creates additional complexity because relationships are much more likely to require legal remedies and expensive systems for legal compliance. So in the next part of this video, we're going to take a closer look at the complexity of so-called simple enterprises to understand where that complexity comes from. Welcome to part three of the Fair Shares Guide. In this part, we're going to look at how so-called simple enterprises don't deal very well with complexity. But before I do that, we need to look a little bit more at what I mean by complexity. 
So complexity is where you've got several interest groups, where none of them have got a monopoly on knowledge. And in order to get things done, you have to negotiate a consensus between them on how to own, govern and manage the enterprise. There's plenty of research evidence that thriving and sustainable enterprises do find ways to navigate uh, how to bring different groups together, but also to manage their divergent interests. Entrepreneurs, providers of labour and the users of goods and services don't necessarily share interests and they all live in a different community of practice. So what I'm now going to do is play a short video about Ralph Stacey's complexity theory and how simple organisations try to run themselves in a way that does not address complexity. All Ralph Stacey did, and it was absolutely brilliant, was combine two axes. One, an axis of agreement and an axis of certainty. The axis of agreement is political agreement. Political in the sense of if you have a decision or a problem or a policy area that you're dealing with, you either have high level of agreement, everybody agrees on this, on the problem or the policy, they want it done, no problem, no difficulty, or low level of agreement, nobody agrees, everybody wants different things, everybody wants to do different strategies. So you have one axis of agreement. On the other axis, he said, right, what is the degree of certainty, the certainty that we know on the policy area. This is where your experts have a high degree of certainty. Everybody knows what the problem is, they know how to deal with it, and they're strongly certain of how to solve whatever the problem is in the policy. On this axis, you go from high certainty to low certainty. The experts disagree. Multiple ways of answering the question, multiple ways of dealing with the problem. When there's high certainty, they know how to deal with it. When it's low certainty, they don't. Now, just using these two simple axes, you wind up with a zone, let's call it the zone of order, or evidence-based policy making, where everybody agrees what the problem is, and the experts know how to solve the problem. A whole variety of areas where this can be done, but this is the zone of traditional evidence-based policy making where artists and targets work. This is the home of traditional policy making. Let's assume the experts know what the problem is and they know how to solve it, but different actors want different things. Here we begin to move into areas of disagreement. Here, we begin to start talking about areas of political decision making. Different groups have to be brought together to discuss it. Bargains have to be made. Agreements have to be made between different groups. Experts know how to solve the problem. The policy isn't confusing. It's just different groups want different things. Really here, we're talking about political decision making. Over here, everybody agrees. No problem, we know the solution we want. We know the direction where we go to, we know the policies that are there. Problem is, we don't know how to get there. Experts become less and less certain as to what strategies should we take to solve the problem. At best, you have judgmental decision making, where experts are trying to find a consensus. The difficult area, combines both high uncertainty and low degrees of agreement, you wind up with what could be called the area or the zone of disorder or chaos. Let's say if we move into a zone where actors don't agree, different groups want different things, and in fact they want to do uh, different strategies to solve the policy problem. And in essence, the best you can do is as if you're walking through a maze where the walls of the maze are changing with every step you take. Here, incremental decision making, small strategies, constant adjusting is the best you can possibly do.
Now the interesting thing is, what about this big area between all of this? All this area here is basically a zone of complexity. Political decisions, experts disagreeing, trying to find a consensus, trying to manage the problem, mixing different strategies. The key thing that the Stacey diagram demonstrates is that with normal policy problems, actually you have a whole variety of strategies to choose from. The fundamental problem for our current policy strategy, our Westminster model, is that everything is supposed to come here. This is the golden zone of policy. And what it constantly demands is that we should drag all of our other decisions and put them into here. And that somehow all of these should be dealt with in this particular zone with evidence-based strategies, with targets, audits, etc. That winds up crushing all the variety and the real decision-making that's made on an everyday basis. So in Ralph Stacey's complexity theory, we can see that there's a tendency to try and solve problems and develop solutions in a wholly unrealistic way by assuming that everything can be dragged into the zone of order. Any enterprise that doesn't design itself to address complexity actually makes life more difficult for itself. Sometimes you need to involve multiple stakeholders, Sometimes you need to exercise judgment, but most of the time you need to adapt and deal with complexity and chaos. So if organisations are complex, why are so many organisations designed as if they are not? By excluding the very stakeholders that they need to develop solutions to the problems that most of them face. We're going to see now in this next section who gets excluded in each of the most popular enterprise designs. Audio jungle. Audio jungle. Welcome to part four of this guide to fair shares. In this section, I'm going to go through each of the popular forms of enterprise and show how they fail to deal with complexity. I'm going to start first with private enterprises that don't have investors, perhaps started by one person or two people going into business together. How do they fail to deal with complexity? Well, it's really quite simple. Labour, users and investors are not recognised as owners of the products and wealth that their interactions create. Wealth is created when people who labour produce goods and services that users want to use and people who back them often share in the wealth that is created. Also, founders acquire exclusive control over intellectual property needed to generate wealth. What this means is that people who actually create that intellectual property, the labour force of the organisation, are then excluded from the wealth that is generated by it. That's just a byproduct of this type of enterprise, because if you are an employee all the intellectual property that you create goes to the owners of the business. And if there's just a small enterprise with one or two owners, they acquire all the IP through their exclusive shareholding. Private enterprises without investors exclude labour, users and investors from membership. Instead, they enter into a series of contracts in ways that lead to exploitation and, of course, conflict. So founders have to engage with the complexity, bureaucracy and expense of commercial contract law and employment law to address the failures in their constitution. The simple constitution fails to address the complexities of attracting labour and satisfying users. OK, now let's look at a private enterprise that does have investors. How does that fail to deal with complexity? Well, of course, labour and users are still excluded from a fair share of the wealth that their interactions create. But if you have investors, you're now going to have competition between the founders and the investors to extract wealth from labour and users. Founders can address the relationships with investors by modifying articles of association that accommodate their interests but it will still fail to address the complexities of satisfying product and service users and providers of labour. 
OK, now let's see how a charitable association fails to deal with complexity. Charitable associations get money from donors, grant givers, members and sympathetic lenders, maybe. The users of a charitable association become its beneficiaries and they're typically excluded from determining how the wealth that has been given to the charity is allocated to meet their needs. This comes under the purview of trustees. So the founders, Labour, and those donors and members, none of them are supposed to profit from the wealth created by stakeholder interactions. It is supposed to go to the beneficiaries. So in a charity and a non-profit, the founders, and later on the trustees, have to be guided by trust law, which says what they can do with the money from donors and how they can allocate it to users who are beneficiaries. The constitution still struggles with the complexities of labour relations and it can still create barriers to borrowing money from investors. Now there's another type of charitable organisation called a foundation. How does that fail to deal with complexity? Well, charitable foundations tend to attract a different kind of social investor, often wealthy individuals or corporate sponsors, sometimes people who are called impact investors, and even governments. They will have users, but the users may fund beneficiaries by purchasing the products of labour, and they still have little power to control how the wealth is allocated. As with a charitable association, founders, labour, and users are not supposed to profit from the wealth created by their interactions. It's the social beneficiaries, the venture philanthropists, the rich individuals who put their money into the organisation, and of course the people who they want to be beneficiaries, who will see all of the benefits from this type of enterprise. Next, we're going to look at worker cooperatives. Do they also fail to deal with complexity? Unfortunately, they do. It is laudable that labour becomes the main beneficiary of the wealth created by stakeholder interactions. And labour can also make social investments through what's called a capital contribution. But worker cops have their own problems. Research has shown that they try to use up the power of founders. And those founders can behave unpredictably by retaliating, by leaving, or perhaps by demutualising a worker co-op to prevent the loss of their power. They can be users of a worker co-op and they can still be beneficiaries, but they don't have collective power to allocate the wealth that is generated by the enterprise. So a worker co-op can deal with the complexity of labour relations, but other contractual relations with investors or users are unaddressed. And there is this issue of whether founders are going to come to resent that their power has dissipated and been marginalised by a growing workforce of members. Now, last but not least, there are consumer co-ops, sometimes called user co-ops. They're similar, or their failure to deal with complexity is similar to a worker co-op. But this time, users have become the main beneficiary of the wealth created by stakeholder interactions and it's labour that is excluded. Users, as in a worker co-op, can make social investments through capital contributions and become social investors. But users and consumer courts limit workers and founders' power, and they might even regard them as having a conflict of interest. So for example, in many consumer courts that I've studied, they limit or completely exclude worker consumers from being on the boards. Workers can still benefit as users. So for example, I am a member of the co-op store and I know that there are employees in the store that can also be a member but they have no power as workers to allocate wealth that is equivalent to the power of users. So in consumer co-ops the founders can address the complexities of relations with users or customers but they still have to resort to the complex bureaucratic and expensive contracts with labour and that applies also to developing expensive contracts if they try to secure external investment. So to sum up part four, all of the popular forms of enterprise with which we're familiar make things more complicated by failing to deal with complexity. 
The only way you can deal with complexity is to enfranchise all of the stakeholders on which the enterprise depends for success. And that's what I'm now going to talk about in the last and final part of the Fair Shares Guide. Welcome to the fifth and final part of this guide to fair shares. Now we get to the crunch. Now we're going to tell you what it's like to constitute a fair shares enterprise based on everything that we've learned so far. In this section, uh, we're going to tell you about European social cooperation and the way it's leading to the creation of solidarity co-ops. In 2007, um, the European cooperative movement uh, lobbied the EU Commission and the idea of a European cooperative society was introduced. And this brought together some of the practices within the movement to combine ownership by users up to 75% or over 75% rather, and non-users who would hold less than 25% of the ownership of a co-op. Across the co-op movement, what we've been calling founders, labour and users would all be considered users in European cooperative law. A non-user is somebody who didn't found the organisation, has not provided labour, is not a user or consumer of the goods and services. And the reason that non-users don't get given more than 25% of ownership is to prevent them blocking decisions that want to be taken by users. Now this has led to the idea of a solidarity co-op. And in the UK, uh, the Fair Shares Association and others, like Somerset Cooperative Services, have embraced the new principles in cooperative law to create solidarity enterprises. And this is a multi-stakeholder approach to social enterprise. So every Fair Shares enterprise recognises founders, labour and or users, that's users in the Fair Shares sense, as classes of member. And if you constitute as a cooperative or a company, you can also issue these groups with shares to recognise them as investors as well. Now, fair shares, values and principles can be operationalised through associations, cooperatives and companies. If you use the association model, all you do is create memberships. But if you use the cooperative and company model, you can also issue shares. Now, let's consider the order in which things happen in a fair shares solidarity enterprise because an enterprise is built over many years and all you need to be sure is that your constitution will provide for the future you don't have to configure everything from the outset firstly founders are necessarily the first people to provide labor and they may also be the first to use the goods and services and make investments particularly if the cooperative has been established to do production for use. Next come labour. They necessarily do things before any users know of, use or can buy goods or services. And even if users are involved in product and service development, they can't actually use them or purchase them until later. Investors, in my experience, if they invest at all, won't do so until they can see the products of labour and satisfy themselves that there are people who want to use them. So the order in which things occur is founders first, then labour, then users, then investors. Now a fair shares constitution is designed, as we've stressed throughout, to reflect how the world is when all interests in an enterprise are treated as having equal legitimacy. While it doesn't release an association cooperative or company from the complexities of different bodies of law, it does open a pathway to reducing the costs of legal compliance by allowing you to build alternatives to it. Founders, workers, users and investors can invoke clauses in the Constitution and do a number of things. They can share intellectual property. It means that you write into the Constitution different um, conditions of engagement for your workforce and your users. You don't operate the private enterprise system of intellectual property management. Then you can engage in new modes of exchange that don't necessarily have to follow the rules of the market. Your users and your producers now belong to the same organisation, 
so you can devise your own rules of exchange that don't have to go through market pricing mechanisms. Thirdly, uh, because people are members and because they are equal before the law, you can use mediation to resolve disputes. And we write this into our constitutions. It means that if somebody wants to engage in an adversarial legal process, you can point to the constitution to say, no, you must mediate first. And lastly, because all of these different stakeholder groups are framed as members and shareholders, you can actually practice shared ownership, governance and management. Let's summarise the argument so far. In all the popular enterprise forms that we're aware of, the norm is to exclude key stakeholders. Usually you enfranchise just one, and you might include others if you can think of a good reason to do so. The logic is the reverse in the fair shares enterprise system. You start by including your key stakeholders, the ones you must need to survive, and you only exclude a group if you can think of a good reason to do so. Now we can think of some reasons or some circumstances in which one or more groups might be excluded. So let's now look at these. Firstly, there can be a case for worker cooperatives and employee owned enterprises. For example, if you've constituted a business that doesn't supply the public and only supplies other businesses, then it might make sense not to have user members or user shareholders. Similarly, if you're a user cooperative or a user owned enterprise and your labour force are all users as well, then it doesn't necessarily make sense to have both labour and user members. So in a food co-op, you grow the food and you eat it. In a tenants co-op, you might look after your properties as well as live in them. So a first generation fair shares enterprise will encourage cooperative management and governance involving all of the four member groups. And throughout that first generation, it's more likely that you will have discrete member groups. A first generation fair shares enterprise will also still have its founder members. And it doesn't change or end its first generation status until all the founder shares have been cancelled, which might occur when the founders die, or if the founder is an organisation when it is dissolved, or when an individual or a legal entity surrenders their shares because they want to hand them over to the other stakeholders. Now, a second generation fair shares enterprise, many of the investor shares will now be owned by users and labour. So you begin to see different patterns of ownership. Labour and users acquire control by actioning the power transfer mechanisms that are built into the fair shares model. So both users and labour can acquire shares in a cooperative and a company through what's called a member share issue. Each time the enterprise generates a surplus, some of that surplus is used to acquire investor shares for users and labour members. So in the second generation, the fair shares enterprise has no founder members and the bulk of the ownership of the enterprise is held by its users and its labour shareholders. So let me now conclude. A fair shares enterprise is structured to reflect real world complexities in order to make running your social enterprise simpler. That simplicity is achieved because legal compliance with rules that exist to manage conflict with non-members will fall into disuse naturally when they are included as members. Fair shares enterprises can accommodate both production for use and production for market, because labour members can also be user members. And fair shares is based on research informed assumptions that inclusive cooperative management addresses complexity to simplify management. So all that remains now is for me to show you the resources that we've created if you want to go further into the use of the fair shares model. Firstly, we've created a fair shares website and if you click that link, you will find this page. This page uh, gives you introductory articles and gives you an overview of the logic of the fair shares model. We also have a fair shares community and you can access through our fairshares association.com website. 
If you click on that link, you will open this page. If you scroll down, you can see that you can get to the Fair Shares Association, the Fair Shares model, and on the right hand side, you have an online community so you can join other people who are using the Fair Shares model and ask questions about how it's used. Then we have a technical support site. This is a wiki, same technology as Wikipedia, uh, and you can navigate around this and get technical information on the terms that are in the Constitution. And there's also help, very helpful information on how the different rules inside the Constitution work. Then we have a novel, a very accessible way of learning about solidarity co-ops, the social economy, and specifically the fair shares model, hopefully in an amusing way as well. So you can go to that by going to click that link and you'll get through to our Create Space page where we've published this book. It's available in print and in Kindle version. Then we have a full length book. This includes a 70 page introduction on the history of solidarity co-ops and the development of the fair shares model. Uh, the second section has a whole series of learning activities, which I'll show you in a moment. And the third section has three model constitutions, one for associations, one for co-ops and one for companies. Just show you. Here's the page on create space for the, fair share, the case of fair shares. Then we have academic conference papers, journal papers, and learning materials. Let me show you these. So here are the fair shares materials. These are held in a Dropbox. If you click the link, it will show you this Dropbox. These are Word documents that you can download and use. And then we have academic articles. If you click through to the links, this is a conference paper that was given in Australia. And this is a journal article that was published in a Croatian journal uh, about the links between um, social enterprise and the fair shares model. So we hope you use it well. Uh, do join the community, ask your questions, we'll help you as best we can and join our voluntary association to create a fair shares world. Thank you very much. Audio Jungle.